Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is our first lesson from 1 Samuel chapter 16. Before the sermon, I'll read again verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So far, God's word. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to seek and to save those who were lost, dear Christian friends. November 29th, 1970, that was a big day. Well, not, not for you probably, not, not for the world, but, but for me, it was a big day. I, I was 11 days old, and in Hurley, Wisconsin, I was baptized. And when I was baptized... God washed away the sin I was born with, marked me as his child. It all started on that day. And you've got your day, too. The date of your baptism when God started your life of grace. It's a big deal. It was a big day. And certainly that wasn't the last time God poured his grace out on me. Oh, just by giving me Christian parents, he, he blessed me tremendously. He saw to it that I had a Christian education. He, he, he gave me my, my calling as a pastor. He gave me an absolutely wonderful family to live, in, live with. God has been so good to me. And his blessings, his spiritual blessings to me really started that day, November 29th, 1970. He's been faithful ever since. You'd say the same thing too uh, about the day you were baptized and everything that God has done for you since then too. God has been so good to me. Which makes me ask the question, why is it then, given all that God has done for me, that I can still be such a jerk? I don't even throw the word around lightly, jerk. If you look it up uh, in the dictionary, to, uh, a jerk is someone who is contemptibly obnoxious. Now, I'm not saying I'm always a jerk. I hope I'm not mo even most of the time a jerk, but oh, I certainly can be a jerk. I think of when I am a jerk, when I am contemptibly obnoxious, and I, I think it's most often when I'm trying to be funny, and I end up saying something that is insulting about someone that I'm talking to. Who wants to be insulted? Even in a joking way, who wants to be insulted? That makes me contemptibly obnoxious when I do that. I guess I could take solace in the fact that I'm not the only one. I'll bet most of you would admit you could be jerks too at times. Some of you can be jerks when you're angry, right? And you say things that otherwise you wouldn't say. Instead of keeping a lid on it, you, you take that lid purposefully off and just let everything fly out so that everyone knows how you feel. Yeah, that, that, that would make you contemptibly obnoxious, wouldn't it? Some people are contemptibly obnoxious they are jerks when they don't get their way, right? And when, when instead of simply adapting and adjusting to something that's new, they, they just let everyone know, this is not the way I wanted it, this is not the way I planned it, my way is better than every other one else's way, and that becomes contemptibly obnoxious. I actually knew a person who was... Uh, uh, the biggest, the time when he was the biggest jerk was when he was right about something. And he couldn't stop from telling everyone that he was right about whatever it was that was being discussed. And that made that person contemptibly obnoxious. Of course, I really can't criticize any of you because I got my own problems. I'm a big enough jerk that I can't really criticize anyone else for being a jerk. And I sh it shouldn't be that way, right? It shouldn't be that way. God graciously washed me clean of sin and made me his child. Why should I ever live like a jerk? 
I guess we can all take comfort, though, in the calling and anointing that David received in our text. Because if there was ever anyone who had a large amount of grace poured out on him by God and then had to look in the mirror one day and said, how could I have done some, such a contemptibly obnoxious thing? It was David. God was gracious to David. There wasn't anything about David that made God choose him. In our text, God let Samuel know that he has decided to replace Saul as king, and so David goes to Bethlehem, has all of Jesse's sons go in front of him, and you know what? There's only one of Jesse's sons whose name we remember. We don't name our sons Eliab. We don't name them Abinadab. We don't name them Shammah, but sometimes we name them David. David's a good name because David was the one that the Lord chose. Not that anyone would have known it by looking at him. He was the youngest one. He was the runt of the litter. He, he was the one who was so unimportant that at this sacrifice, he was just left out with the sheep. He was probably somewhere between the ages of 12 and 15 at this time. But by God's grace, he was chosen. And and. and before God revealed that he was the one that was chosen, God spoke those memorable words to Samuel. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord sees things that we can't see. So David, chosen by grace, was to be the next king of Israel. And David, chosen by grace in the next chapter, was given the ability when he went to visit his older brothers at the front lines of the war between the Israelites and the Philistines with a stone and a sling, he was able to kill the giant Goliath. And David, by grace, had songs sung about him. And David, by grace, when Saul grew jealous, was kept safe. And even the king of Israel in all of his might couldn't kill David because God had in mind to spare David's life. And David, by grace, finally became the king. And David, by grace, restored the worship of God to Jerusalem. Won all sorts of battles. He was, in God's own words, a man after the Lord's heart. And then David, after having all this grace poured on him, well, you know what he did the one night when he looked out and he saw a beautiful woman bathing. Committed adultery, committed murder to try to cover up the adultery. What a jerk. What a contemptibly obnoxious thing to do in God's sight and in human sight for that matter as well. But then we remember what the prophet Nathan said. When David was confronted with his sin and he admitted his sin, Nathan said, the Lord has taken away your sin. Had David done anything to merit this forgiveness? Of course not. Just as he hadn't done anything to merit any of the grace that God had given him up to that point. Just as he hadn't merited being anointed as king in the first place. God decided to pour grace out on him. And God decided to pour grace out on me. And God decided to pour grace out on you. Because he loved us. Because he wanted us to be his own. And he started pouring that grace out on us, for most of us, when we were baptized. Think of it. I didn't decide at 11 days old to be baptized. Most of you did not decide to be baptized either. That decision was made for you. And God arranged for that decision to be made because he wanted you to be brought to him through the waters of holy baptism. And when you were baptized, it's impossible to overstate what a huge thing happened. You were united to everything that Jesus is and everything that Jesus has done. What he did became yours. He became part of you. He sent his Holy Spirit into you. So that now, when you and I act like jerks, 
God doesn't see the jerky things we do. When you and I say things that we regret, God purposefully doesn't hear those terrible things we say. Instead, when God looks at us, he sees all the good things that Jesus did. Because your baptism has united you to Jesus. And when God hears you, he hears only the gracious words of life that Jesus spoke while he was on earth because your baptism united you to Jesus. You were anointed with the Holy Spirit. You were saved through baptism, as our second reading says, saved through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Like I said, it's impossible to overstate what a huge thing happened when we were baptized. 1 Peter 3 makes it even more clear. Baptism saves us. It actually says those words, baptism saves you. And we've been saved. Not because we deserved it, but because God decided he wanted us to be with him forever. He saved us. Of course, that brings us to another baptism. A baptism that had really nothing to do with the recipient's salvation because the one who was baptized didn't need to be saved. You go to our gospel reading and there's Jesus being baptized. What does the perfect son of God need with a washing of his soul? He's already perfect. He's already clean. Why is he being baptized? In fact, we read that John, in John's gospel, John objected to baptizing Jesus, and Jesus said, no, it is necessary to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus underwent baptism to show that he's one of us. To say, yeah, even if I haven't committed sin like you, Jesus says, I am one of you. I am a human being like you. And I am putting myself under God's commands because I'm going to fulfill them for the simple reason that you can't. And of course he did. He fulfilled that regulation. He fulfilled every single regulation of God because we can't and we needed him to. But something else happened, though, at the baptism of Jesus. The Spirit of God came down. The voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. There is something different about Jesus from this point forward, at least something different about the way people saw Jesus. Up until this point in his 30-year life, Jesus was known as nothing but a good man. A perfect man, sure. No one had ever seen him sin. But beyond that, nothing special. The son of a carpenter. That's how he was regarded. From this point onward, Jesus begins his ministry. He begins teaching people. He begins preaching about the word of God. He begins healing people. He begins performing all sorts of other miracles. He begins those works of his ministry that lead up to him offering his life and taking it back, that life back in his resurrection and it starts here because there's another aspect to this anointing that, that is also equated with our baptisms. Baptism means salvation, yes. And, and that salvation is there waiting for us and it is real. But baptism also has meaning for our daily lives as well. The idea of anointing in the Old Testament, was to call something holy. The word holy means set aside for a special purpose. The first time we ever see anointing in the Old Testament is after Jacob runs away from his parents after deceiving his father, and he lays down one night at a place called Bethel and uses a rock for a pillow. And during the night he has a vision of angels going up and down a staircase as God shows him that God is still going to protect him even as he leaves his homeland. And Jacob takes that pillow the next morning, pours oil on it, to, he, he anoints it and says, this place is holy. This place is a special place. And 
Throughout the history of the Old Testament, that place, Bethel, was a special place of worship. God does the same thing to people in the Old Testament. He does it with King David in our text. He takes David and says, David, I'm going to take you apart from every other man in Israel, and you are going to be the next king. Only you. There isn't going to be a campaign. There isn't going to be election. Because I've already decided. It's going to be you. And though it takes years before it actually happens, it's destined to happen. It has to happen because David is the Lord's anointed. There was even special oil that they used. It was olive oil based, but it had special fragrant herbs that were added to it. The recipe's there in the Old Testament that people would know that when someone was anointed, something special was happening. The prophet Elijah was called to anoint prophets and kings. And he did so with that oil. And in doing so, he was saying, this is what God has determined you're going to do in your life. All that just makes the point. When you and I were baptized, we were granted the gifts of forgiveness and eternal salvation. But there's more to it than that. We were also anointed to serve. We were set apart from other people in this world to do God's will. God doesn't expect the unbelievers in this world to do his will. How can they? They don't know him. They don't love him. You and I, on the other hand, we've been set apart. We have been set apart to be model sons and daughters and mothers and fathers and wives and husbands. Not only have we been set apart to do that, we've been empowered to do that. God has given us the ability to do his will, though we still fight against our sinful natures. Because like we told the kids, that which God has put into us never burns out. In fact, the more we use his word, the stronger our faith is. The more we reflect God's love, the more we have God's love inside of us. And yes, we do have to confess that we haven't always lived up to our calling. We haven't we, we haven't fulfilled our responsibilities to the best of our abilities. And yes, it's also true. If we so desire, we could throw off this anointing of God anytime we want and say, no, I kind of like being a jerk and I'd like to devote my life full time to being a jerk. I want to be contemptibly obnoxious to you, God. It happens. Just this past Thursday, the Board for Spiritual Life chairman and I had to sign a letter to one of our members who has purposefully resisted every call that we've made to them to come back to church and make use of the means of grace. In that letter, we had to make the statement, we do not know if you have saving faith anymore. There is no evidence of that. It can happen. But to you and to me, who sit at the Lord's throne and receive through his means of grace that strengthening oil of love that burns inside of us, it isn't going to happen. Just the opposite. We're going to grow in love for our God. We're going to grow in our desire to serve God and those around us. Because we know what a gift we've been given. And we know that when we look in the, in the mirror, there's nothing that we see in the mirror that makes God love us and makes him pour grace out on us. We know that he simply has decided to do it because he loves us. We are anointed by grace. Grace. He came to us when we were dead in our sins and made us alive in Christ. We are anointed to serve. Even as we look forward to the joys of heaven, we long to show our thanksgiving to, our, to the God of our salvation in how we live our lives. God grant that we do so for the sake of our Savior. Amen.
and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.